So thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to speak with you. I'm uh, very excited to uh, be able to have a conversation with you uh, to share a little bit about my research, uh, my current project, which is focusing on the question of Muslim-Jewish relationships around music in Algeria and its diaspora. And in particular, to come back to this, what is sometimes described as the old chestnut of boundaries uh, in anthropology and in social science more broadly. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to walk first through a, you know, a classic discussion of boundaries in anthropology, uh, just to give you a little sense of where I'm coming from. And then uh, as quickly as I can, I'm going to get into the musical question. And I'm gonna walk through four different ways uh, that I've encountered people in Algeria and in France uh, talking about the Muslim-Jewish relationship. Um, and these four ways, um, I think, give us a rich sense of the possibilities of boundary, uh, as well as some of the problems. And so I'm going to be uh, really thinking out loud in some ways today uh, as I walk through those. And just to give you a little bit of a taste beforehand, uh, I want to draw on uh, a few conversations I had in Algiers way back when I started this project in 2009. And uh, each of these gives a sense of one of those paradigms of interpretation, uh, at least three of the four that I'm gonna talk about. And the first one uh, came up in a conversation about a Jewish musician who had stayed in Algeria after Algerian independence in 1962. And in this conversation with a scholar and aficionado of music, we were discussing this particular singer. I was asking him about recordings uh, and their availability. And the person I was speaking to said, you know, that Jews were Algerians, they were from here. And for me, this is a very, you know, this is a very familiar, this became a very familiar sort of assertion, an assertion of fraternity, of codis citizenship. Now that same day, in another conversation, uh, I was looking at a YouTube clip of an Israeli ensemble playing North African music, and particularly in this case, an Algerian uh, classical uh, piece. Um, and I was discussing with the person who showed it to me the, uh, some of the problems with the timbre of the singer's voice. And the person I was speaking to said, yes, that's because Jews played this music, but it was never theirs. And this struck me also as something uh, quite strong, quite powerful. And the third uh, comment that I heard that day that stuck with me was the following. That was the Belle Epoque in the 1930s when there was a rivalry with Jews when it came to music and moved things forward. Now, these three, I'd say, somewhat contradictory assertions, one about fraternity, the other about hierarchy, and the third about rivalry, uh, were striking to me, particularly because they came from the very same person. And at the time, I thought that this showed a certain indecision or a certain contradictory um, attitude on this person's part. But as I moved further into this research, I realized that the coexistence of these sorts of interpretations is ubiquitous, um, both in Algeria and in France. And so one of the things I'm gonna try to get to at the end, uh, by the end of this talk is why these can coexist, how these coexist, uh, and what boundary theory might give us uh, in terms of thinking through that, that problem. So to begin with the question of boundary theory, the, um, the starting point for, I think, all discussions of the boundary, ethnic or ethno-religious or social boundaries in anthropology, comes from Frederick Barth, the Norwegian anthropologist, uh, and from his very well-known introduction to a 1969 volume that he edited, um, Ethnic Groups and Boundaries, the Social Organization of Cultural Difference. And in many ways, Barth's point is very simple. It's embodied in this particular sentence. The critical focus of investigation from this point of view becomes the ethnic boundary that defines the group, not the cultural stuff that it encloses. Now, Barth was not the first to come up with this sort of formulation. Uh, I'd say that since the 1930s, uh, from a variety of uh, British uh, and American anthropologists, there were similar points being made. But he put it very succinctly and in direct uh, dialogue with the question of the study of ethnicity. And the thing that I also find uh, striking in Barth's point 
um, is the following, which comes out much more clearly, I'd, I'd say, 25 years later uh, when he revisits ethnic groups and boundaries. And he says, one major impetus to ethnicity arises if people can be made to join in creating the appearance of discontinuity by embracing a few neatly contrasting diacritica rather than the variable and inconstant whole of culture. An imagined community is promoted by making a few such diacritica highly salient and symbolic, that is, by an active construction of a boundary. This will always be joint work done by members of both the contrasting groups. And so to schematize this a little bit visually, if we think of the diagonal line in this figure as the classificatory difference between two groups, and we think of the circles as various diacritica, what we can see here is that Barth is saying that some of those diacritica are going to be focused on to further elaborate the boundary, right? So there's the classificatory difference diagonally, which is simply there, yet to really make the boundary uh, in Andreas Wimmer's uh, interesting uh, interpretation of Barth, we really need to be focusing in on specific diacritica and making them salient and solidifying that boundary in this way. Now, I'm just gonna throw out one more uh, particular thing I've been reading recently that gives a slightly different vocabulary. Uh, and this is the work of the philosopher Edward Casey, uh, who tends to differentiate between boundaries, which he thinks of as somewhat more fluid, and borders, which he thinks of as more finely drawn, uh, uh, more sharply drawn. And so another way of reading this sort of thing is that we have a somewhat fluid boundary, and then what Barth is talking about as the work of building up the boundary is what Casey might call the building up of a border on top of a boundary. And I'm going to come back to these possibilities in a little bit. Now, in the work on uh, Muslim-Jewish relationships in the Maghreb, and particularly in Morocco, which has been the focus of that literature since the 1970s, uh, a Barthian strain is very clear in discussions of the uh, emphasis on certain diacritica and the leaving aside of others. And so in this particular image, what I'm trying to represent here is that much of the literature on Jewish-Muslim relations in the Maghreb have emphasized there are certain diacritica that get built up uh, in making this boundary. So typically worship, uh, commensality, eating together, uh, and kinship, as being sites of differentiation. Yet much of the anthropological literature on Muslim-Jewish relations has also pointed out that there are spheres of life in which the um, differentiation is attenuated. It may still be there, such as in the marketplace, right? So we have this dotted line at the top of this figure. Um, the marketplace may be a space in which that categorical differentiation uh, between Muslims and Jews gets attenuated. Yet, there are other spaces in which there is a stronger differentiation made. Now, when we think about this literature more specifically, um, the work of Lawrence Rosen uh, in, the, in the Moroccan city of Sefru really developed aspects of this quite clearly. So for him, uh, the fact that there was a hard boundary between Muslims and Jews in certain spheres could in fact make the other side of that boundary attractive. So you write, sometimes the very fact that the Jew is in the full sense of social reciprocity, the non-competitive position with the Muslim allows a kind of intimacy that is less possible within one's own network of obligation, kinship, and gossip. And so what we can think of here in Rosen's reading is that that boundary, or in Casey's terms, that border in fact, may make the other side attractive for certain sorts of activities, uh, certain possibilities that may be more difficult on one's own side of that border. Now, when we come into the Algerian case, uh, this we can find a somewhat similar um, discussion on the Algerian side of the border. And this has been most uh, richly and beautifully developed in the work of the anthropologist Joël Bahloul, who herself uh, partly grew up in Algeria, herself is an Algerian Jew, uh, and has written very richly about uh, cuisine, about culinary spaces, um, and the question of Jewish-Muslim relationship. 
uh, in those spaces. And in her model, we can see something uh, somewhat similar to the marketplace model and a little bit uh, similar as well to Lawrence Rosen's work. But what Bahlul tends to emphasize is the idea that there are shared ingredients, shared tastes, uh, shared dishes um, that have long connected Algerian Jews and Muslims. However, that sharedness also gives the raw materials for rich senses of differentiation within that commonality. And so what Bahlul suggests is that uh, we can find all sorts of ways in which cuisine, in fact, reproduces, replicates the boundary, fine tunes it, plays with it, develops it in all sorts of ways. And some of these differences, of course, are connected to Jewish dietary restrictions. So um, we have the famous case of couscous uh, being made in the Jewish case without butter, so as to not uh, mix milk and meat. But some of this also goes beyond the question of kashrut, the question of Jewish dietary law, to be rich senses of differentiation um, that are both consciously and unconsciously made. Now, the other aspect of the, um, there's another aspect of the Algerian case that is, uh, I'd say, significantly different from the Tunisian and Moroccan case uh, in degree, if not in kind. And that's the question of the presence of France. So the fact that uh, France uh, was the colonial power from 1830 to 1962, of course, absolutely remade Algerian society, including the question of the Muslim Jewish boundary. And a key landmark in this is 1870, when we find uh, uh, most Algerian Jews being summarily granted French citizenship, um, while Algerian Muslims remained colonial subjects. And this uh, conferral of citizenship, of course, brought Jews into the political process uh, in French Algeria and into the uh, French school system. So within a few generations, uh, most Algerian Jews had shifted from Arabic to French in everyday uh, communication. And by the, by the time we come to the decolonization struggle in the 1950s uh, and uh, Algerian independence in 1962, the bulk of Jews leave uh, Algeria for France alongside the French settler population. So one of the ironic things is that today the term Pied Noir which typically uh, referred to French uh, Christian settlers, has also sometimes been applied and even used by um, some Algerian Jews. So in this way, there's an interesting way in which in the Algerian case, the Muslim Jewish boundary has a tendency to get subsumed, at least partially, within the Algerian French boundary. Now, musically speaking, there are some very interesting ways in which Jewish prominence in Algerian musical life uh, complicates these questions. So within the Algerian uh, French boundary, we find some very interesting examples of a whole group of Jewish uh, singers in the 1950s and 60s uh, who specialized in a blending of French and Arabic, uh, sort of code switching between French and Algerian Arabic. Uh, and one of the very famous ones is Lina Monti, um, who is also known as Leila Fatah. So she has this uh, kind of dual name that reflects that boundary. I'm just going to give you a little taste of her music, this Franck Arab style uh, of the 50s and 60s. Um, and in the translation uh, in English, the italicized words are from uh, Algerian Arabic. Now, um, uh, I'm sorry to cut this off, but it's, it's a seven minute song uh, and I cut off the, the prelude, the istighbar. Um, but lest we think that um, Jews were exclusively specialists in Franca Hab, I should emphasize that the vast majority of um, Jewish uh, professional performers in the 19th and 20th century were working with straight up um, Arabic uh, repertoire of various kinds, including the high prestige um, more classical repertoire um, as well. And so just to give you a little sense, this is a, just a little piece uh, from uh, Algerian television with Alice Fitoussi, uh, one of the great uh, Algeroise singers, um, performing a piece that's directly from the classical Algerian repertoire. And she's one of the very few uh, Jewish performers who stayed in Algeria after independence. <laughs> 
So this gives you a little bit of a sonic sense of the range of styles um, that we're talking about. And what do we do with this? What, you know, what, uh, what, have, um, what happens in terms of how does this musical range get talked about uh, in terms of the Muslim-Jewish relationship? And you know, as I mentioned earlier uh, in my opening anecdote, the idiom of brotherhood is, I would say, the very first um, way in which uh, this relationship uh, around music between Muslims and Jews gets talked about uh, in the present and to a degree in the past as well. So the film uh, El Gusto, documentary film that traces uh, Muslim and Jewish musicians coming back together after a long um, separation um, by Safina's Busbia. Um, the subtitle here says a great deal, right? History separated them, music brought them together. And in this idiom, what we see uh, very commonly here is this uh, idea that music, like the marketplace uh, in some of the classic uh, literature on Morocco, is this space of attenuation, of crossing boundaries, of uh, a erosion of the boundary, an attenuation of the classificatory difference. Um, and so this is a very strong idiom. This is something that, uh, that comes up uh, quite a bit. Um, in conversations, in all sorts of, uh, of, of discourse around uh, music and uh, Muslims and Jews in Algeria. And one of the terms that is very much emphasized is this idea of cement. So I was struck how often this comes up, this idea that music was cement that joined Muslims and Jews. Right? So one of the things that this tends to do is this tends to emphasize a uh, uniformity of musical style, right? So we have this image of cement as a sort of substance which is uniform. Uh, and we also have this strong sense of differentiation between Muslims and Jews, right? So the cement, if we are thinking about these two blocks that come together thanks to the cement, there's this clear sense of differentiation between Muslims and Jews, and then the cement that brings them together. Um, and for me, this uh, you know, I call it idiom of brotherhood in part after the work of uh, the anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro, um, who has uh, talked about uh, the idiom of brotherhood as a sort of dominant uh, way of thinking about relationship uh, in the European context and in many other contexts as well. And he writes, two partners in any relation are defined as connected insofar as it can be conceived to have something in common that is as being in the same relation to a third term. To relate is to assimilate, to unify, and to identify. And so what's happening in uh, Viveros de Castro's kinship terms is the two um, brothers in his idiom are, uh, are in relationship, they are identified, unified, assimilated with one another through common parentage. And what's happening, of course, in the idiom of brotherhood around music is that music is standing in for those parents, right? The thing in common in this uh, discourse is music. Uh, and so a great deal is riding on music as this connector, as this hyphen, as this bridge. Now, when we start looking more closely at the historical uh, record, and also to a degree contemporary discourse, contemporary memory of the Algerian past, we can quickly find cracks in this facade of brotherhood. And we can quite quickly find ourselves in what I'm calling the idiom of hierarchy. So if we keep in mind that the uh, 
traditional status of professional musicians in Algeria, in the Maghreb, and in fact in many other societies uh, was quite low, we can start to see how this idea of Jews as specialists in music might in fact be, talk, be a sign of something else, of something uh, more hierarchical, uh, less equal than suggested in the idiom of brotherhood. And this brings us in some ways back to this image from Rosen, right? So Rosen was talking about a sort of integration, but that depends on a strong sense of a boundary, right? So the idea that a Muslim patron might go to a Jew for a particular service, right? So that's one way of reading this question of hierarchy. Um, now, when we start to look more broadly, of course, things get quite compl complex. We can find lots of examples of Jewish and Muslim musicians playing together, right? Jews did not have a monopoly on uh, professional music musicianship. Um, however, we can also find some very interesting examples, uh, particularly from the 19th century, in which there's a very sharp differentiation uh, among some listeners between Jewish musicians' specialties and Muslim musicians' specialties. And this, of course, looks a lot like Bahlul's diagram, but what's different about this one is the idea of a hierarchical difference, a difference in prestige. And so what we can imagine here is there is this sort of space, this, this vaguely shared space of musical materials. However, there is also this idea that there is a particular version or a particular genre specialization of Jews that is in fact uh, inferior to that which is found among the mus Muslim musicians. So what we can see here is a kind of shared space, yet there is also this differentiation, this recreation of the boundary or the border within that space, and it's reproduced on, in unequal terms. Right? So this is a very uh, sharply different sort of reading from the idiom of brotherhood. Now, I would say the third of the four uh, idioms that I would like to look at is another one, which is the idiom of rivalry. And in some ways we can think of rivalry as, a, uh, as the flip side of hierarchy, right? So if we think about hierarchy in terms of a clear hegemony, a clear sense that uh, everybody on both sides of the hierarchy knows where the line is and who is on top. In the case of rivalry, we have something much more unsettled. And this is most clearly visible in the interwar period uh, particularly in Algiers, where we see a flowering of amateur musical associations playing on the whole high prestige music. And we see some mixing of Jews and Muslims in these associations, but we also see a tendency of associations to either be predominantly uh, Jewish in membership or predominantly Muslim in membership. So we see Al Mutrabiya, the first amateur association in Algeria, um, sometime uh, in the interwar period, and the, uh, this was an ensemble primarily made up of Jews, although in this period, the, uh, the director of it was Muslim. Uh, and we can find other associations um, that were predominantly Muslim in membership. This one, Jazeera, being a very important one, founded in the early part of the, of the 1930s. And so when I try to schematize this, uh, this is in some ways back to what we saw uh, when we were thinking about uh, the marketplace in the classic literature on Jewish-Muslim relations in Morocco. But what's important here is this is a space of competition, right? There's a kind of uh, attempt to either take control or benefit from certain sorts of prestige associated with music. There is this question of a struggle uh, between uh, two sides over this common space. Right? And so this is, uh, this is I, I'd say, a, stri a striking third uh, idiom in discussions of the Muslim-Jewish relationship around music. And finally, I want to talk about the idiom of affinity. And I'm borrowing here again from Viveros de Castro, who writes, Amazonian ontologies post postulate difference rather than identity as the principle of relationality. If all men are brothers-in-law rather than brothers, then a relation can only exist between what differs and insofar as it differs. Difference is a condition of signification and not a hindrance. 
So if we think about what, uh, what this is in musical terms, the most developed way that we can find an idiom of affinity is in discussions of Jewish voice. Now, this is a fairly rich discourse that I've been particularly interested uh, in, in, uh, in uh, this year, in my research this year. And in some ways, the discussion of Jewish voice can slide into this question of hierarchy. So for example, there are uh, a fairly developed discourse of uh, that Jews sang differently in Arabic, and that this primarily reflected a kind of either miscomprehension of Arabic or mispronunciation of Arabic. So this kind of solacistic uh, reading of Jewish voice certainly falls into the idiom of hierarchy. However, when we start to really dig deeper, I find that usually when, uh, when I encounter uh, people, uh, mainly Muslims, but occasionally uh, Algerian Jews as well, speaking of a Jewish voice, it actually tends to have a more positive or at least neutral ring to it. And this tends to hinge on the idea that Jewish singers um, sang with more vibrato, with more rubato, with more temporal elasticity, and with more melisma, in other words, singing of one syllable on many different notes. Um, and of course, this is an attribution, uh, and we can find many examples where this is in fact not the case. However, we can also find uh, situations where we can hear this sort of difference. So just a very brief example from Mohammed al-Kurd, a uh, Muslim singer from Annaba in the east of Algeria. He's gonna be singing a, uh, just a short line from a, uh, from a very well-known piece from the classical repertoire. <laughs> And now we're going to hear Salim Hilali, who is also from Annaba in the east of Algeria, a Jewish singer, um, and it's the same line. <laughs> Of course, uh, you know, we could play this over and over and over again, and I know a few of you who are listening have heard this in many other versions. Uh, but what I want to emphasize here, of course, you know, we don't hear that much difference in terms of vibrato, but when we do start to listen carefully to these two, there is this clear emphasis on rubato, on temporal elasticity in the case of the Salim Hilali recording, as well as on melisma, on this, on this usage of a single syllable for many different notes. And this is just, in a nutshell, this, uh, uh, an example of this idiom of affinity that I'm talking about. And of course, this resonates with Bahlul's work on cuisine. Uh, it resonates as well, interestingly enough, with the hierarchical model that I presented uh, just a few moments ago. However, what's very strikingly different here is the idea of equality, right? So for me, we're, we are in the idiom of affinity whenever there is this discussion of difference, yet difference without hierarchy. So this, uh, these four uh, idioms are, um, have been uh, very important for me in terms of think, kind of organizing my ethnographic and historical uh, archival work. And you know, thinking uh, today about uh, where we can go with this in terms of boundary theory, um, has been quite helpful um, and at the same time quite challenging. And so I'm just going to wrap things up here and then I'm going to open it up uh, for your questions. Uh, I'd love to get your comments. Um, for me, the, the basic model in Barth already explains a great deal, right? So when we think about uh, what struck me at one time as sort of contradictory uh, assertions of uh, connection and difference, are already there in the Barthian model, right? So in this basic model on the left, um, in essence, Barth is saying that what the two groups share is the boundary. The boundary is, in some sense, uh, this shared membrane. And there is an aspect, uh, an aspect of this uh, that places a certain ambiguity uh, there at the root, right? Already in the concept of boundaries, we have this question of, the intertwining of, of commonality and difference. However, there are also ways that um, I think that we need to go further 
than, uh, than uh, the basic Barthian model. Now there's lots of work that has happened since. Uh, I'm by no means coming up with something entirely new here. But one of the things that um, the Muslim Jewish question in the Maghreb, uh, both with regard to music and other domains, raises is this question of the suppression of difference. And there's a way we can, in fact, reread Barth. Uh, we can talk about if people can be made to join in creating the appearance of continuity by suppressing a few neatly contrasting diacritica. An imagined boundary a community is promoted by an active deconstruction of a border. And so I guess this does get to a uh, misgiving I do have, which is that there is, of course, this, uh, this emphasis on construction in Barth that can at times go a little bit too far. And in fact, in his later work, uh, Barth admitted this uh, to a degree, uh, which is to say uh, we have this sense in Barth that there is um, a active construction of difference, right? There are these differences that are there already. And then there's this active work to, to uh, emphasize these. But at the same time, when I'm looking at the Muslim Jewish case uh, around music, I can also see moments in the idiom of brotherhood, for example, where difference, difference in voice, difference in class, other sorts of differences get suppressed in order to kind of stake out this space of commonality. So there, you know, that is a piece of the picture um, that I think is, that deserves a great deal more uh, attention. Um, and in doing this, I do find uh, Edward Casey's differentiation of border and boundary to be helpful, right? So in a way, um, Barth's work is saying, look here, if we're gonna talk in Casey's terms, the border is the work of the social, right? It's this kind of clear, this effort to make things clear, while the cultural is this sphere of somewhat vague difference, this somewhat fluid space. And what I think uh, Casey's differentiation of boundary and border helps us do is to start to take a little bit more seriously that space of what Casey would call the boundary, right? So, much of the attention in Barth has been on this question of the building of what Casey would call the border. Uh, but I would say that in many ways, uh, the work I've been doing has been really pushing me to think about, well, yes, there is the creation of that border, but let's also think about the details of that boundary, um, which is, of course, a more fluid space, a more difficult space uh, to map out. And it's also a more difficult space to talk about, both for the researcher and for the practitioner from within the milieu I'm studying. And so in uh, conclusion, in some ways, when I think about this array, brotherhood, rivalry, hierarchy, affinity, what I realize is that uh, in order to talk about the richness of this Muslim-Jewish relationship in uh, the Algerian context, um, it's, in, it's, it's absolutely necessary to have more than one lens, that we have to bring them together to start to get at the richness of what is in fact there.